Remember, I, I saw your new movie, uh, Rat, 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 Rabbit Test. And uh, it inspired me to write a song for it. It's called The Hormone Blues. Oh, it's, it's wonderful. Would you like to hear it? Sure. Okay. Went to bed last night with hair up on my chest. I woke up this morning with a couple of beautiful breasts. No, I'm... Changing. <laughs> Thank you, ma'am. <laughs> well, she touched me like she knew me, Marlene. <laughs> Take a bath. <laughs> It's a little tough to watch something like that, those two people. You know, it's always easy to say when a legend passes into history that they change the world and often for the better. And sometimes we in the media and certainly the general public we might go overboard in such cases. But when it comes to making us laugh and making us think twice about what shapes our everyday lives, Joan Rivers indeed leaves behind a legacy of more than just making us laugh. Can we talk? Welcome to Midpoint. He's a comedian, but also one who wrote material for Joan Rivers and thus knew what indeed was inside the queen of means thinking. Also the author of several books, one of them filthy, funny, and totally offensive, and his latest effort is called Properly Make Them Laugh. Jeffrey Gurian joins us today. Jeff, thanks so much for being here. You're very welcome, Ed. Thanks for having me. Pleasure. When you first met Joan Rivers, I mean, everybody sees the nasty queen of mean on the outside, but when you first met her, were you a little bit hesitant, though? Did you know a little bit about what made her tick, and maybe that's something that puts a little, little worry into you right away when you met her? I had no idea what to expect, and I was so pleasantly surprised. The way it came down was I, I had been writing for the Friars Roast for many years. This was back in 1992. And uh, I had got a message from her manager that Joan was interested in talking to me about writing for her. Now, I had another job. A lot of people in entertainment have day jobs, you know, they're waiters and stuff. But I couldn't find the job as a waiter, so I had gone to dental school. And I was practicing as a cosmetic dentist at the time. And I went to Joan's house. And I thought that she knew about my other field because most comedians, most big stars, don't invite writers to come to their home. So as I got to her home, she lived in this palatial townhouse, and her doorman said to me, you have to wait a couple of minutes because Joan just sprained her ankle, and she's in a lot of pain. I thought to myself, wow, this is great because I can write her a prescription for painkillers, and I'll look <laughs> like a hero. <laughs> and then she'll hire me to write for her, right? So I had to wait a little while. When I went up to her house, I realized that she didn't know about my other field because she introduced me to everyone as Mr. Gurian. We sat there. We had a great interview. We got along so well, and she hired me on the spot to write for her. A few months go by, and she was the sweetest, nicest person, exactly the opposite of her stage persona. A few months go by, and I get a call in my office one morning, and my nurse had strict instructions, never interrupt me while I'm working except for show business. So she comes into the room and she says, Dr. Rivers is on the phone. And I'm like, Dr. Rivers? Okay, I'll be right there. And Joan says to me, uh, what do you do during the day? She was in Las Vegas. <laughs> and, and her assistant saw me on TV. So, she, so I, she knew. So she says, what do you do during the day? And I said, well, I work. And she said, well, obviously you work. What do you do? And I said to her, is this concerning the vicious rumor going around that I'm a dentist? I said, no. I've heard of accusing people of a lot of things, but that's really low. <laughs> and she just laughed and she's like, why didn't you ever tell me? And I said, because nobody hires you in show business because you're a dentist. They hire you in spite of it. Well put. And she thought it was so funny. And we laughed about that. And we got along so great. And then I wrote for her for a while. Jeff, is it fair to say that certainly what made her different and what set her apart and what created that legend was the fact that it was self-deprecating humor? It wasn't that she simply went after everybody. She went after herself, made fun of herself more than she did anybody else. And I think that in itself exactly. opened her up and also then made a lot of female comics specifically say, you know, I can do this. And they never saw that before. Well, you know what? She was very empowering to women. And, you know, her self-deprecating humor, first of all, she was a beautiful woman. I thought she, I, you know, I said this yesterday. Uh, I, I had a crush on Joan. I thought she was great. And, you know. Well, as Joan would say, you could then have ago, a crush on several different Joan Rivers because, of course, there were several different Joan Rivers. <laughs> exactly. But when she was starting out, women couldn't look good on stage, like people like Lucille Ball and Carol Burnett. They always downplayed their looks. You know, because my feeling is that because in this country we respect women too much to laugh at them sometimes. Like men, it's easy to laugh at men because we make fools of ourselves very easily. We do that naturally. But with women, it's harder. 
and especially in those days. And so she did a lot of self-deprecating humor. But she was, I, if, if I could tell you, she was the sweetest, nicest, kindest person, exactly the opposite of her stage persona. When I saw her recently, most recently in June, uh, she, she came up to Sirius XM Radio to do an interview with Ron Bennington from Ron and Fez. I'm a regular on that show, and I bring on special guests. And they knew that I'd want to see Joan, and they kind of brought me in as a surprise to her. She was secluded in the green room. And with my friend Larry Amaros, who's her writer now, and just wrote this new book with her. She was promoting her book, Diary of a Mad Diva. Mm -hmm. And they brought me in, and she was so excited, she gave me big hugs. And she was asking me a lot of questions about my book. That's how she was. She was very interested in what other people were doing and asking about Chris Rock because he wrote the introduction and asking about who was my hardest interview. And I said to her, Joan, let me give you a copy of the book. And she said, absolutely not. She goes, I don't want anything for free. I want to buy your book. I want to support you and the book. And that's how kind she was. And she had her assistant come and take a photo of the book so that she could order it when she got home. Isn't Jeff, that nice? I, she just, there's so many stories about Joan, really, that many people did not know about what a giving person that she was. I got about a minute left here, and as a writer and a comic, I have to ask you, work with Joan Rivers. Can you think of one or two jokes that you wrote for Joan Rivers that actually people would recognize, or the two best jokes you wrote for? Well, one stands out in my mind. Uh, one topic that, we, that she used to like to talk about was dating older men. And I wrote her th this joke. I dated one guy who was so old, the only thing firm about him was his cane. <laughs> uh, second one, maybe? <laughs> I don't have a second one handy. Okay. Just all I want to say is that her funeral yesterday, I was at the funeral, and it was very fitting for a queen. Every celebrity in the world was there. Donald Trump and his wife, Don Jr., uh, Geraldo Rivera, Jeffrey Ross, Judy Gold, Kathy Griffin, Rosie O'Donnell. I saw them all. Everybody was there paying their respects to this queen of comedy who left us much too soon. There was no reason for her to go. She was perfectly healthy, and she just went in for this elective procedure. And it's just so sad that she's no longer with us. Fitting indeed. She'll be sorely we'll be, uh, missed. We'll be listening to her material and watching it for many, many, many years. Jeffrey Gurian, many, thank many, you so many much. Many years to come. Oh, you're right about that. Jeff, thanks so much for joining us, my friend. Continued luck and success. Thanks for having me on. Pleasure. Uh -huh. Next hour on Midpoint, the intelligence community sits up and takes notice about the new book on Benghazi when Midpoint continues.